standing up. They're all banding up um, to come against the children of Israel. And we see that it's very similar to the last chapter in verse number 5. It says, When these kings were met together, they came and pitched together on the waters of Miram to fight against Israel. So here we have kind of the, the last campaign is what we're kind of seeing um, in Joshua chapter 11. Verse number 6, God again reassures Joshua. He says, Be not afraid because of them. For tomorrow about this time I'll deliver them all up slain before Israel. Thou shalt hew their horses and burn their chariots with fire. So Joshua came and all the people of war with him against them by the waters of Miram suddenly, and they fell upon them. And the Lord delivered them in the hand of Israel, who smote them and chased them upon great Zidon, and unto Mitzparaphimaim, and the valley of Mitzbah eastward, and they smote them, and they left none remaining. And Joshua did to them as the Lord bade them. He hewed their horses and burnt their chariots with fire. So hewed their horses. Uh, first of all, what that means is like, he like, you know, I don't know if there's any horse lovers in the room here tonight. I'm sorry, but he basically, um, he made their horse, he hamstrung their horses. He cut the back of their, their legs so they were lame, their horses. You know, and if that bothers you, you clearly didn't grow up with the horses that I grew up with because, you know, that kind of makes me happy, actually. But anyway, no, I'm just kidding. But anyway, you know, there is a little bit of, I mean, this, is, this, this kind of shows you what God thinks about, you know, you know we kind of have an obsession with animals today, if you have a problem with the things that I just said. Um, it's actually, turn to Romans chapter 1. So one of the things that I noticed when I moved to California, it was a very, it was quite different in California, people's um, attitudes towards animals as, you know, versus where I came from. And you say, oh, were you mean, were you a meanie head to animals? No, we weren't mean to animals. Animals were um, of use. Animals were tools um, when I grew up. You know, horses were tools. Horses, you know, cows were a business. Uh, sheep were a business. These were livestock things that you did. And obviously, if you have, uh, it, it always, you know, animal like rights, laws, and all this kind of stuff always seem, you know, kind of stupid to me because if you're a rancher and you take care of cattle and you raise cattle and things like that, why would you, you know, damage your product or why would you um, mistreat the thing that makes you your living? You know, it doesn't make any sense. Um, however, you know, animals die, animals come and go, and you know, all dogs don't go to heaven. As a matter of fact, dogs don't go to heaven. So you won't find that in the Bible. Animals were just, they're for our use right. on the earth. That's what animals are for. And God was just telling them, hey, these are, these are wicked people. They're using these tools against you. You need to take these tools away from them so they can't use these tools anymore. They burnt the chariots, and they also made the horses useless as well. So, you know, we have an obsession with animals today, and that's one thing that you will see, by the way, um, as a society becomes more and more wicked. I'm not saying if you love your dog, you're a wicked person. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that a society, one of the things that I always noticed about liberal people, I noticed this from, like, when, when I was the youngest kid. I noticed this. If you ever remember the game show Wheel of Fortune, my, my parents always watched Wheel of Fortune when we were growing up. So I'd come home from school or whatever and Wheel of Fortune would be on. And is it still on? Is it still going? Probably, right? Maybe not? I don't know. But anyway, I would always notice if somebody was like a crazy liberal person because sometimes they would have like a celebrity Wheel of Fortune and the celebrities would be playing for a charity, right? And the, the normal people would be like, I'm playing for the children's hospital in Fresno, California, or whatever. But when you had like these liberals, they'd always be play, playing for the charity, would always be like a cat shelter or something like that, or the SPCA. And I always thought that was just the strangest thing. I'm like, will you put the life of, a, of an animal over a person? Is what I would think as like a, as like a teenager, I would think that. I just thought that's very strange. That's very odd to me. But the Bible actually tells us that. The Bible actually tells us that's a sign that people, that society are heading in the wrong direction. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 25. The Bible says, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the what? The creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. This of course goes into Romans chapter 1, goes into the most wicked people on the earth. People that are literally rejected by God. And one of the characteristics of that is that they're more sympathetic towards animals than they are towards even the creator of the universe. 
which is crazy, but that's exactly what you'll see happen as a society just lets go of God more and more. Okay, I'm not saying don't love your dog, okay? I'm not saying don't love your cat and don't love your pets, but look, animals come and go. Right. Animals come and go, and they're not people. They don't have souls, okay? So that's how we can read Joshua chapter 11, verse 6, and not be like, oh, you know, God's mean to horses. You know, I mean, horses, they were a tool of war in this chapter, that we're reading, and that war was being waged against God's people. Okay, look at Joshua chapter 11 and verse number 10. Joshua chapter 11 and verse number 10. Now we're going to see Joshua going through and doing what he was supposed to do. He's doing complete war. He's doing, um, you know, complete battle, and he's doing um, exactly what he's supposed to do um, to his enemies. In verse number 10, the Bible says, And Joshua at the time turned back and took Hazor and smote the king thereof with the sword. For Hazor before time was the head of all those kingdoms. And they smote all the souls that were therein with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. That means they did exactly what they were supposed to do. They wiped them all out. Not, there was not left any to breathe, and he burnt Hazor with fire. The cities of those kings and the kings of them did Joshua take and smote them with the edge of the sword, and he utterly destroyed them. Notice how smote, smiting them with the sword does not necessarily mean that he utterly destroyed them. So the Bible gives that extra detail. As Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded. But as for the cities that stood still in their strength, Israel burned none of them, save Hazor only. That did Joshua burn. And the spoil of these cities. So these cities... They utterly destroyed the people, but the spoil, meaning the property, the cattle, um, the sheep, the, all the livestock, um, they took for themselves. They, and the, the cities and the cattle, the children of Israel, took for a prey unto themselves. But every man they smote with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them, neither left they any to breathe. As the Lord commanded Moses his servant, so did Moses command Joshua, and so did Joshua. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. So Joshua took all the land, the hills, and the south country, and all the land of Goshen, and the valley, and the plain, and the mountain of Israel, and the valley of the same, even from the Mount Halak that goeth up to Seir, even unto Belgad, in the valley of Lebanon, under Mount Hermon, and all their kings he took, and smote them, and slew them. And Joshua made war a long time with those kings. This did not happen in one day. Okay, this was a long campaign that lasted for a long time, the Bible says. There was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel, save the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon. All other they took in battle. Now this is interesting. Look at verse number 20. So Gibeon, out of all of these, all of these cities, the only ones that made peace were the people that were in Gibeon. And we read about that um, a, a few weeks ago, how the Gibeonites kind of came and they kind of had a ruse and they kind of tricked Joshua to make peace with them and make a deal with them. And, you know, for whatever reason, um, God allowed that um, to happen. But look at verse number 20. For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts. So it says, nobody else made peace like that. Why is that? In verse number 20, it says this. It says, For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts, that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might destroy them utterly, and they might have no favor, but that he might destroy them as the Lord commanded Moses. Turn to Exodus chapter 7. So notice, I mean, isn't it strange as you kind of read along and there's all these victories and all these miraculous events. Imagine the giant hailstones and the sun, you know, standing still for 24 hours as the children of Israel just destroy these armies. You would think somebody else would give up. You know, you would think somebody else would say, okay, you know, we're good. We can't fight against giant hailstones and somebody that can literally move the, the solar system. You know, we can't handle that. But nobody gave up except for the Gibeonites that made a deal. But look, they kept fighting and God gives the answer right here. The Bible gives the answer. It said, the Lord hardened their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle. God didn't want them to give up. God wanted them destroyed. God wanted them destroyed. Turn to Exodus chapter 7. We see another example of this in the Bible when God is commanding Moses to go talk to Pharaoh. In Exodus chapter 7, look at verse number 2. The Bible says, Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, and that he send the children of Israel out of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, 
that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgment. So, I mean, why? So, I mean, it makes sense that as they went through all these plagues that, you know, you would think that Pharaoh would get it after three or four. You know, I mean, they go through all these plagues, but he doesn't. And God explains why that he's not going to get it. And he says, and the Egyptians, in verse number five, shall know that I am the Lord. When I stretch forth my hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. God hardened the hearts of Pharaoh. He hardened the heart of Pharaoh who hated him in the Bible to accomplish a specific task. And that task was, number one, to free the people. Number one. And number two, to show the Egyptians who is the Lord. God literally is explaining to Moses here that I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart just to show that I'm the Lord to this nation. Remember all the people of, of, of Egypt saying to Pharaoh, the whole land is destroyed. What are you doing? What are you doing? And Lord just kept hardening his heart and hardening his heart and hardening his heart because God wanted to make an example of Pharaoh. So he had a purpose for it. And in Joshua, again, he has a purpose for hardening the heart of these kings. So it's to accomplish, it was really two purposes. It was number one, to accomplish the complete victory so they could possess the land that he promised them. And number two, it was to complete the judgment on these people that they deserve. Remember in Genesis chapter 15, he says, you know, the iniquity is not yet full. At this point in time, the iniquity of these nations is full. And God's judgment is coming down on them. And God is using the children of Israel. It's kind of a double-edged sword, so to speak. God is, is giving the children of Israel the land that he promised them, number one. And number two, he's judging these people that hate him. He's accomplishing two things with one task. So that shows you why, you know, God hardened the hearts of these kings and why they didn't give up, which makes me, you know, believe, you know, this is just my opinion, but it makes me believe that the Gibeonites probably weren't as bad as the rest of these other nations. They probably weren't as wicked as the rest of these other nations, which is why, you know, I think that God allowed this peace to be made between the Gibeonites and the Israelites. Now look at Joshua chapter 11 and verse number 21. And at that time came Joshua and cut off the Anakims from the mountains, from Hebron, from Deber, from Anab, and from all the mountains of Judah, and from all the mountains of Israel. Joshua destroyed them utterly with their cities. So here we see something different. We see these other group of people here, the Anakims. And they were cut off from the mountains and all of these different places in um, the mountains of Judah, in the mountains of Israel, and all these different places, Joshua destroyed them um, with their cities. So who were the Anakims? Who were the Anakims? Let's look at that for a few minutes. Who were the Anakims? Turn to Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 4. Now, first of all, who's heard of the Nephilim? Raise your hand if you've heard of the Nephilim before. Okay, about half of you. Okay, so uh, good. That's a good thing. <laughs> Because the word Nephilim is not found in the King James Bible. Okay, instead, what we have is these people called the Anakims. And I'm going to read to you Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 4. And I am not going to open up the can of worms that is in Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 4. We are just going to talk about the Anakims. Um, the can of worms in Genesis 6, 4 um, and a, a few verses before and after that um, is it deserves its own sermon, maybe its own uh, Bible study in general. Okay, but look, um, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 4, the Bible says this. It says, There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bare children unto them. The same become mighty men which were of old men of renown. The only thing we're going to look at this evening is that very first um, phrase there, it says there were giants in the earth in those days. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 2. So in Genesis chapter 6, before the flood, the Bible says there was giants in the earth. Now, this is exciting. This sounds exciting. There's giants in the earth. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 2. Deuteronomy chapter 2. What does that have to do with the Anakims? Deuteronomy chapter 2, look at verse number 10. 
The Bible says this. The King James Bible says this. The Emims dwelt therein in times past, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims, which also were accounted giants as the Anakims, but the Moabites called them Emims. So, Emims, Anakims, same thing. Okay? Same thing. And they are equated to these people that the Bible calls giants. So, in Joshua chapter 11, when in verse number 21, when Joshua is fighting these people called the Anakims, these are the giants. So, Joshua literally fought giants in the Bible. And he won. He won. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 9. Deuteronomy chapter 9. Moses even told the people that the children of Israel knew that they were going to face these people. It makes sense that God would have mentioned it, right? It makes sense that God would have mentioned, oh, by the way, you're going to go in and you're going to fight these battles. Oh, by the way, you know, some of them, they're really, you know, they're giants. You know, they're big people, right? Look at De Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse number 2. The Bible says, a people great and tall. Great means big here. A people great and tall. The children of what? Of the Anakims, whom thou knowest, and of whom, whom thou hast heard say, who can stand before the children of Anak? I mean, can you imagine? I'm sure that was a saying. I mean, can you imagine fighting giants? I mean, when you go up and you want to fight somebody, you know, or whatever, you're going to, I mean, the last thing you want is for them to be a giant or to be way bigger than you. But look, Joshua drove them out. He drove them out. But the point I'm trying to make here is that giants in the Bible were real. Giants in the Bible were real. So you say, well, how giant were they? You know, were they 450 feet tall? Okay? You know, the, the, where do people get that, first of all, that they were 450 feet tall? I'm going to tell you where they get it. They get it from this book that's not in the Bible called the Book of Enoch. Okay, and look, the Bible mentions, you know, that, you know, people will look at Jude chapter 1 and verse, number, let's, let's just go ahead and turn um, to Jude chapter 1 and verse 14. Jude chapter 1 and verse 14. Here's the, here's the problem, okay? There's this book called the book of Enoch. There's also other books called the book of Jasher that are mentioned in the Bible. The book of Enoch is actually not mentioned, but in, jo in uh, Jude chapter 1 and verse 14, the Bible says, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesies of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands, thousands of his saints. So there was, a, there was a book of Enoch found. There's a book of Enoch out there, and it has that exact verse in it. So thus people will say, Oh, Jude chapter 1 and verse 14 is quoting the book of Enoch. So the book of Enoch must have some validity to it. However, you ever think that maybe because the Bible says something that maybe another book just copied it? That the book is not... Look, the, the book, the reason the book of Enoch and the apocryphal books are out there and they're not in the Bible and they're not considered to be, you know inspired documents is because they have contradictions everywhere. They contradict the very Bible itself. Some people will say, oh, they can be used for historical context. The book of Enoch is not an apocryphal book anyway. It's just a, it's just a book that was, that was out there and is, is a Jewish historical uh, book. But in the book of Enoch, it mentions giants. And it mentions this from the book of Enoch. I'm going to read it for you. And it says, and they be, and quote from the book of Enoch, and they became pregnant and they bare giants whose height was 3,000 L's. So an L, by the way, is considered a, a natural cubit, who consumed all the acquisitions of men, and when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. So an ancient L is actually the same as a cubit, about 18 inches. Therefore, the text actually, it doesn't say 45 or 450 feet, it actually says 4,500 feet, if you do the math on that. But many people, they take the book of Enoch and they're like, oh, that must have been a textual error. This is how stupid this is. That must have been a textual error. They couldn't have been 4,500 feet tall. It mu they must have missed the decimal point. It's only 450, okay? So the people that are claiming 450 feet tall giants are, number one, reading the book of Enoch, which is not in the Bible, and number two, they don't even believe that the book of Enoch is correct. 
because they're correcting the book of Enoch that's not in the Bible. It's, I mean, it's a perfect example of why it's not in the Bible. I mean, 450 feet tall. The Statue of Liberty is like 100 and some feet tall from the base up. So just imagine. <laughs> but anyway, go to 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse number 4. Verse number 17 and uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse number 4. So that's where they get, that's where you see the, the stupid YouTube videos with the, the thumbnail of the giant head with the little man or whatever. You know, it's, it's all fake. It's just from, you know, it came originally from this book of Enoch and it, it's, it's dumb. So it's not in the Bible. Let's see what the Bible actually says. Okay. Now look, uh, look, look at Joshua chapter 11 and verse number 22. Go back to Joshua first, put a, put a thumb in 1 Samuel 17, and go to Joshua chapter 11 and verse number 32, or number 22, I'm sorry. Joshua chapter 11 and verse number 22. Remember the incomplete conquests, by the way? Remember when Joshua, when it didn't say he utterly destroyed them? Remember those incomplete conquests? There's a reason that we, I brought those up, because it, it comes into play. Look at verse number 22. It says, there was none of the Anakims left in the world. Look what it says. It says, there was none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel. They drove them out. They did not utterly destroy them. Okay? It says, there was none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel, only in Gaza, in Gath, and Ashdod there remained. So they pushed them out, and they still remained in Gaza, Gath, Ashdod, there still remained Anakims. Well, that makes sense, because look at 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse number 4. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse number 4. The Bible says this. It says, And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines. This is when you know, Saul's army is camped up against the Philistines. There went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath. Of what? Of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of his coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders, and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. So look at verse number 4. It says his height was six cubits and a span. So a natural cubit is 18 inches. Okay, It's a foot and a half. The span is the span. A natural cubit is actually from the tip of your finger to your elbow is what a cubit um, is kind of measured by, but it's just typically thought to be 18 inches since that differs a little bit with everybody. A span is, is the distance from a thumb to the pinky of an outstre outstretched hand, which is supposed to be um, about half of a cubit. Okay, so look, this man was six cubits and a span. So he was basically six and a half cubits tall. And basically, if you just do the math on that, he was nine feet, nine inches tall, this man. Not 450 feet tall. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 3. Deuteronomy chapter 3. Goliath was nine feet, nine inches tall. Look, that's a big man. That's a giant man. Okay, Shaquille O'Neal, I think, is what, 7'1", or something like that? He's a big guy. Okay, but look, first of all, there's men on this earth that are 7 feet tall right now. Okay, so 9 feet, 9 inches tall, that's a big man. All right, look at Deuteronomy chapter 3 in verse number 8. Thus, the word giant. Deuteronomy chapter 3 in verse number 8. The Bible says, And we took that time out of the hand of the two kings of the Amorites, the land that was on this side of Jordan, from the river of Arnon unto Mount Herman. This is the battle before they even came into the Promised Land, which Herman, the Sidonians call Syrian, and the Amorites call it Shinar. And all the cities of the plain, and all Gilead, and Bashan, and Salka, and Edri, to the cities of the kingdom of Og in Bashan. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of what? Of the giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabbath, the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth thereof, after the cubit of a man. This bed of it doesn't tell us how big the king was, but it tells us his bed was 13 and a half feet long. 
and it was six feet wide. Now, if you look at like just the pro proximity of, of, a, of an 80 inch normal bed and an average five foot tall, nine inch, you know, average man today, you know, this guy could have been up to 11 feet tall is what the Bible is saying here. I mean, look, this is a big man here. This is a giant. Now go back to uh, verse number 23. Let's finish off Joshua, and then let's talk a little bit more about the giants. Joshua, the last verse says, So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord said unto Moses, and Joshua gave it for an inheritance unto Israel according to their divisions by their tribes, and the land rested from war. So we see that there was giants in the Bible. Is this far-fetched? People will be like, what? There's giants? And look, that, that's why people say that they're 400 feet tall or 450 feet tall because they want to really say, look how stupid the Bible is. That's what people are, that's the agenda behind that, by the way. That's the agenda behind all these other books of the Bible that they find. That's the agenda behind all these other Bible versions that have come out. It's really just this really hidden, subtle agenda to make the Bible look unbelievable to people. Okay, but giants, look, Giants, look, there was a man in 1940 named Robert Wadlow, and he was last measured before he died at 8 feet 11 inches tall. That was 1940. You know, this man, you know, he entered the world no different than a normal baby, but he just grew super fast and he grew super tall. So look, there, was, there are really tall people even today. That are, that are this tall. There was a recent Chinese uh, 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 a discovery. This was like two weeks ago that I, I saw this um, article. I don't know if anybody else saw it, but it was it just a recent discovery in China. And it, I'm going to read you an article from CBS News. The article uh, from CBS News, there's many different um, news sources that covered this story, but I want to read you just the CBS News version of this article. And this is why you need to have biblical knowledge in your life. You need to have biblical knowledge so when you see information that the world puts forth, that's what I'm going to really apply this evening. When you see information that the world puts forth, if you don't know what the Bible says, what's in the Bible, you really have no chance, is what I'm going to show you this evening. So let me just read you this article from CBS News, or some snippets of it. Here's the title, Massive Dragon Man Skull Found in China Might Be a New Human Evolutionary Branch. <laughs> I mean, that right there. So, I mean, right there when I see massive dragon man skull evolutionary branch, you know what I see? You know what I see in that article with biblical knowledge? You know what I see? I see massive skull found in China. That's what I see with my biblical filter. Let me read you parts of the article. A gigantic fossilized skull that was hidden in a well in China for 90 years has just been discovered by scientists, and it's making them rethink human evolution. One of the most remarkable aspects of the Harbin cranium is its massive size, which at nine inches long and more than six inches wide is significantly larger than the modern human skull. So right away, it says nine inches long and six inches wide. Right away, I'm already thinking Bible here. I'm already thinking Bible when I'm reading this. Right away, I think, what's the average human skull size? So I go and I Google it. I Google average human skull length width. That's what I Google. And it doesn't even come up with an article. It just tells you right there. Google just gives you the result. The result is the average human skull length is 176 millimeters. How many centimeters is that? 17.6 centimeters. It's four, 145 millimeters wide, 14.5 centimeters. How many centimeters are in an inch? Who knows that? Anybody? 2.54. 2.54, okay? So you divide that by 2.54 and you get a skull that is 6.92 inches long and 5.7 inches wide. So you look at just the length for simplicity here. We have a nine inch skull on this, this new human evolutionary branch and the modern skull is about 6.9 inches. Nine inches versus 6.9 inches. So right away I wanna extrapolate that to height. How, how tall was this guy? What's the average height today? It's about five feet, nine inches tall. So you extrapolate that ratio of that skull size and you end up with a man that's about 7.5 to eight feet tall. Right there. A new human evolutionary branch, they say. Look, 7.5 to eight feet tall is within the modern realm of possibility. 
And there's people that have been that. I've just read to you that there's people that have been that tall in the last hundred years. But especially if you're reading the Bible, you know that that's possible. So in this respect, I'm like, this is a great story. I even went up and I, I got up and I, I told my wife, I was like, look, look, I found a giant skull from the Bible, you know? But look, if you're reading things through the lens of the Bible, you can see these things. But let's continue to read now and see what most people... Now, here's the problem. Here's what most people will take away from this story, okay? Here's what most people will take away from the story. Let's continue to read and see what most people will take away. The Chinese team said that they think the Harbin cranium is sufficiently unique that it qualifies as a new species. Of course they do. Of course they do. Because it's really big. It's bigger than normal. So they're, And you look at it. They have a picture of it. It looks like a skull that's bigger than a normal skull. That's what it looks like. And they're like, we found a new species. Look, here's another science tip for you. It's so easy to see why this happens because if you're a loser that has never accomplished anything in his entire career, it is much easier to say, I have found a new species than it is to say, man, I found a really big skull, man. This guy was like eight feet tall probably. <laughs> right? I, I found a new species. Right? I mean, so look, that, that's especially if I throw in some pictures, and they throw in some pictures too. Go back to 1 Samuel chapter 17. So here we have a giant skull of a man who was probably eight feet tall, maybe even taller. This man was eight feet tall. That's, that's just my math. Okay, go back to 1 Samuel chapter 17. The Bible would say that this, this person could have been a giant. There was people this big in the Bible, bigger than this in the Bible. Look at verse number eight of 1 Samuel chapter 17. Look at verse number 8. 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse number 8. The Bible says this. This is what Goliath said. Goliath said, He stood and he cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. That sounds like a pretty good deal. All you got to do is... Pick your best guy and kill this guy. And we don't even have to fight a battle. We don't even have to fight where thousands will die. Hand-to-hand -hand combat where thousands of us are going to die. One guy can just go take care of business right now. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Look at verse number 11, though. When Saul and his army heard those words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. This man came out and stood before their army and he said, give me a man to fight. And there wasn't a man in the... Think of the mighty men. Think of the warriors back then. There wasn't a man that was not afraid. Before David stepped on the scene, of this giant, he was a giant warrior standing up there. But guess what? This guy in this Chinese article has found a new species. He's found a giant skull that's probably as big as Goliath, and instead he throws in some pictures to show that it's a new species. Here's Goliath. This is from the article. Imagine, come out and fight me! Send me a man! And everyone's like, man, I'm not going near that guy. He's probably got staff. He's like, man, that guy can't even comb his hair. I'm not going near that guy. This is the picture from the article. I am not making this up. Look, if I want to convince you that it created a new species, I cannot stand up and show you a giant warrior. I have to show you this guy. Okay? Look, how many of you think that this guy stood up in front of the army of Israel? It was like, hey, hey, bros. Bros. I've been sleeping under a bridge for like three years, man. <laughs> Send me somebody. It had been over in five seconds. We wouldn't even have King David. This is the picture from the article. I'm not making this up. <laughs> I mean, look at him. 
I don't care how tall that guy is, I'll fight him. But look, here, here's the thing. This is, this is, I mean, they were terrified of this giant. It was an army of warriors, they were terrified. They would have been like, if they would have saw that guy, they'd have been like, hey, s somebody go kill the little monkey guy. <laughs> I want to go home. So let me just give you, let me just give you two rules for reading the news. Two rules for reading the news tonight as we continue and we just wrap up this evening. Pretty much all you can take from this story of the Chinese skull is this. They probably found a huge skull. That's about all you can take. That's about, look, and so many, and I say, why do I say probably? I say probably because there probably hasn't been any scientific branch with more fakes and more frauds than evolutionary science. You even have to be skeptical that the skull itself is even real. I just found it interesting because I went and I did the measurements. I'm like, hey, kind of matches pretty close to what the Bible would be. But with these evolutionary discoveries, you have to be skeptical about everything. There's been so many fakes. I'm just going to read you just a couple. The, one of the most famous ones is Piltdown Man. Piltdown Man. The Piltdown, look, it's all about the quest for the missing link. We came from monkeys, right? Well, no, we didn't just come from monkeys. We came from amoebas. We came from single cells. We came from trees. We came from, you know, flowers. We came from all these different things. But if we can just prove the monkey to man, because they kind of look the same, you know, you could put, like, human clothes on a monkey. I mean, it's pretty much the same, <laughs> you know? Piltdown man. The piltdown fossils, including a portion of the skull, a jawbone, and a few teeth, were found in 1911 and 1912. So they found a skull and a jawbone that were together. This piltdown man was believed to be many, the earliest Englishman. In fact, the missing link between apes and humans. We found it! Forty years later, in 1953. First of all, let me just say this. Forty years is an entire career. Forty years, if you're lucky, is a whole career. Some poor scientist spent his whole career studying Piltdown Man. And I'm going to show you now. It was found to be the, but in the 1953, the jawbone was found to be that of a modern ape, the orangutan, most likely. And it had been treated with chemicals to make it look as though it had been lying in the ground for hundreds of centuries. The cap of the skull was still thought to be a genuine fossil, but far more recent than originally believed. So they basically took a human skull and a monkey, uh, jawbone, and they put it together. I mean, you know, good work if you can do that. I don't know. Maybe they had a Dremel and they got everything to fit or whatever and all this, and then they bleached it or put chemicals on it to make it all look the same. And 40 years, people believed it. 40 years. They thought they had the missing link. Here's another famous one. In 1974, Lucy was found. I'm sorry, Miss Lucy. Let me apologize. <laughs> Lucy, look, here's what they found in 1974. They found orangutan bones. That's what they found. And, and you have one group of people that are like, you have all these anthropologists that are just like, yeah, those are just orangutan bones. And then you have all these other anthropologists that are like, no, it's the missing link. People still believe that Lucy is a picture of, you know, is a fossil of the missing link. But guess what? Here's an orangutan, okay? That's an orangutan. So you're like, that doesn't sell anybody on the missing link. But all I have to do is if I want people to think that this fossil that I thought that I, and I'm, this is real, I'm not making this up, okay? If I want people to think that I found a new species, all I have to do is have somebody create an image that looks like this is what we've recreated the bones of this uh, find in uh, Africa or Egypt or wherever it was, and this is what we assume that she looked like. And here it is. <laughs> But well, guess what? Guess what? This isn't real. There's never been a person on the planet that's ever looked like this, ever. Like, you can't make this stuff up. People spend their whole lives studying this. It's as dumb as putting Jupiter in a bouncy ball. That's good. That'll be good. Nebraska man. Nebraska man, 1922. This, is, this one's even better. They found a tooth. They found a tooth. Some farmer found a tooth in the ground, and they're like, we've got the missing link. And they're like, we found this tooth, and it's great. And years and years later, they found out it was, it was to a pig. <laughs> you can't take a tooth 
and tell me within at least 25 to 30 minutes that it's from a pig and not a person, you need to find a new career. It's crazy. So look, they found a big skull. It's neat. It matches the Bible. That's all I take from that story. You know, the funny pictures and all that, I'm just like, whatever. But everybody else in this world that knows nothing about the Bible, they're just, they're just drinking this stuff in. That's what they're pouring in their minds in the public school system. It's crazy. Look, you have to look, and here's the second rule. You just take the facts. That's rule number one. Take the, the, the stone-cold hard facts and leave everything else, and then you have to look at everything else through the lens of the Bible. I mean, if you find something in a story that is against the Bible, it, the story's wrong, and the Bible's true. It's a, good, it's a good filter. Look, you must have a biblical lens. Knowledge that men that were nine feet tall existed. That helped me when I read that article. Everything else leave alone. Because here's the thing. Most of the news today is fake. Seriously. Like, it's, it, it's, it's so fake, it's crazy. Just the things that are reported. You know, the, the Florida building collapse that happened. You know, that terrible you know, building that fell down, the condos or whatever, all those people were killed. Look, all you can take from that article is that a building fell down. That's it. The rest of the article is global warming caused this, and it's man destroying the planet. And I'm just like, what in the world? But at least the building falling down is on video. We know that happened. You know, I mean, there's just there's all kinds of things. Like the coronavirus stuff is, is, off, the, is off the hook. Amen. Crazy. Right. Amen. I mean, you just have to, all you can do with these things is just look up scientific studies yourself. That's it. Just look up natural immunity versus mRNA immunity. You'll quickly realize why they started, they stopped even developing some of these coronavirus uh, vaccines from, you know, five, ten years ago. You know, look up why they stopped developing SARS. And then go tell me if, you know, you should have your friends and relatives go out and get this vaccine. Amen. But look, you won't see this. You won't see this. You won't see this stuff. You won't see this stuff in the news at all. It's just not there. There's a clear agenda to the news today to just tell anybody whatever lie they can possibly tell to get everybody to go out and get, scare them into getting a vaccine. Amen. That's exactly what's happening. It's all lies. They're telling you, I mean, first of all, they tell you it's 99% effective like four or five months ago. Then everybody starts getting it. Entire cruise ships where every single 100% of the people on the cruise ship are vaccinated comes back. And, and there's a coronavirus outbreak. Everybody was vaccinated. What in the world? There's a big outbreak in, uh, in, in the Northeast where 75% of the people that, that caught it were vaccinated. Then they're like, oh, it, it's, a, it's a new strain. Yeah, that, that's it. It, look, it's all fake, folks. Two months ago, they said it's going to... Look, I, I, I was lectured by people at my job telling me, you have to get this, or you're putting your family in danger, you're putting your friends in danger, you're putting everybody in danger. And then it's the people that are vaccinated that have it, that are asymptomatic, that are giving it to everybody else. It's exactly the opposite of the truth. Look, it's not the point of the sermon, but the point is the news isn't real. You need to know the Bible. You need to know the Bible. You need to be able to pick out the facts, you know, all you can do is look at that building in Florida and read that story and be like, yeah, that building fell down. That's about all you can take away from that. This Chinese story, yeah, they found a big skull. And oh, that's cool. It matches what the Bible says. Look, giants in the Bible were real. Yeah. You know, the, the things that we read today, the things that are being reported on today. And look, you have to wonder if, if maybe the reporter that wrote about that or the scientist that found that skull, did they even know about the Bible? Did they even know that there was these stories in the Bible about these giants who were about as tall as this skull would show that this man was? Did they even know about it? You know, I would venture to say they don't even have that knowledge anymore. I would venture to say maybe 50, 60 years ago that they had that knowledge, but they just didn't put it in their articles because they had an agenda. But now, I bet you they just, they, know, they don't even know. They don't even know. They think the giants in the Bible were 4,500 feet tall or whatever. Because that's what people think the Bible is today. But look, it is, as we read these things, as we read all the propaganda and the media, we just filter it through the Bible. These giants were real. They were 9 feet, 10 feet, 11 feet tall. It's a real thing. And Joshua fought him. Joshua fought him. And he defeated him. And then da David fought him again and defeated him. So they're real. The Bible has some great stories. 
And it's true. Everything we read in the Bible, that's the beauty of it. You can let your guard down when you're reading the Bible because you're not going to read anything in the Bible that's fake. The agenda of the Bible is Jesus Christ, and that's it. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.